Hello, nephew community. My name is Sean George, Senior Medical Science Liaison with Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization. I am uh, here with Dr. Edgar Lerma, as he will be providing us with an overview of diabetic kidney disease. Dr. Lerma earned his Doctor of Medicine from the University of Santo Tomas uh, Faculty of Medicine and Surgery in Manila, Philippines. He completed residency training in internal medicine at UIC Mercy Hospital and Medical Center, where he also served as chief resident. He completed a fellowship in nephrology and hypertension at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University, and the Veterans Administration Lakeside Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. At present, he holds the rank of clinical professor of medicine with the section, nephro section of nephrology at University of Illinois at Chicago. He serves as the educational coordinator for nephrology with UIC Advocate Christ Medical Center. Dr. Lerma, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. Hi, Dr. Lerma. So um, I'm really excited to uh, do this podcast with you. Uh, last time we went over the topic of hypertensive nephrosclerosis, and this time we're going to be talking about diabetic kidney disease. Obviously, uh, this is a very, very big topic. Um, and, it, you know, typically with these podcasts, we do a uh, little 15 to 20 minute segments and diabetic kidney disease is not one of those that you can cover in that much time, but we're going to try our best to cover as much as we can for our audience today. So it's it's really well known that diabetic kidney disease has become the single most frequent cause of end stage renal disease worldwide. And this disease has devastating consequences. I'd like you to start off by giving us just a little background of diabetic kidney disease by going over the pathophysiology of the disease, and also discuss the overall burden of this disease. So um, thank you for um, that question, Sean. So when we talk about diabetic kidney disease, uh, we have to understand that critical metabolic changes that alter kidney hemodynamics and promote inflammation and fibrosis in early diabetes include um, hyper, um, hyperaminoacidemia, which is a promoter of glomerular hyperfiltration and hyperperfusion, as well as hyperglycemia. In type 2 diabetes, systemic hypertension and obesity also contribute to glomerular hyperfiltration via uh, mechanisms such as high transmitted systemic blood pressure, as well as glomerular enlargement. So glomerular hyperfiltration is a well-characterized consequence of early diabetes. Overall, it has been observed in 10 to 40 percent or even up to 75 percent of patients with type 1 diabetes and up to 40 percent of patients with type 2 diabetes. The mechanisms underlying glomerular hyperfiltration are actually incompletely understood. Um, one plausible mechanism is increased proximal tubular reabsorption of glucose via the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 or SGLT2, which decreases the distal delivery of solutes, particularly sodium chloride to the macula densa. The resulting decrease in tubuloglomerular feedback leads to the dilatation of the afferent arteriole, thereby increasing glomerular perfusion while concurrently increased production of angiotensin 2 at the efferent arteriolar area leads to vasoconstriction. The overall effect is the high intraglomerular pressure and glomerular hyperfiltration that I was talking about. Now, if we go into you know how how the epidemiology of this disease, we have to understand. I, I believe the first description of diabetes dates back to the 1500s BC, and it took probably around three millennia from that first description for us to recognize the association between diabetes and kidney disease. But it took only several decades for diabetic kidney disease to become the leading cause of end-stage kidney disease in the U.S. So as I mentioned earlier, diabetic kidney disease develops in approximately 40% of patients who are diabetic and is the leading cause of chronic kidney disease worldwide. Although end-stage kidney disease may be the most recognizable consequence 
of diabetic kidney disease. The majority of patients actually die from cardiovascular diseases and infections before needing kidney transplant therapy. This increasing prevalence of diabetic kidney disease parallels the dramatic worldwide rise in the prevalence of diabetes. And it is, you know, according to epidemiological reports, um, between 1980 and 2000, the overall prevalence of obesity in adults increased from 15% to 31% in the U.S. By 2013 to 2014, this adjusted prevalence of obes obesity was up to 35% among men and 40% among women. I mention this because this rise in obesity is related or is parallel to this rise in diabetic kidney disease. So in, in short, kidney disease attributed to diabetes is a major but under-recognized contributor to the global burden of disease. And again, between 1990 and 2012, the number of deaths attributed to it, the diabetic kidney disease, increased by 94%. This dramatic rise is one of the highest observed for all reported chronic diseases. Wow, wow, that's some uh, that's some incredible information. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, kind of going back to what you said earlier when you were kind of going over the pathophysiology, um, you said that there is a period of hyperfiltration that occurs, correct? Yes. So, so then it, it makes it somewhat difficult to detect diabetic kidney disease in these patients because their GFR is is going up instead of instead of going down. So uh, I want to ask you, what can be done to detect diabetic kidney disease earlier in the disease? Well, um, the clinical diagnosis of diabetic kidney disease is uh, made on the basis of measurement of two things. Number one is eGFR, which is your estimated glomerular filtration rate. And number two is albuminuria, mm -hmm. along with clinical features such as, you know, the duration of the diabetes, presence of diabetic retinopathy. So diabetic kidney disease is clinically identified by a persistent high urine albumin to creatinine ratio greater than 30 milligrams per gram and or sustained decrease in EGFR below 60 ml per minute per 1.7 meter square. A screening for diabetic kidney disease should be performed annually for patients with type 1 diabetes beginning five years after the diagnosis and then annually for all patients with type 2 diabetes beginning at the time of diagnosis. Now, in patients with albuminuria, the presence of diabetic retinopathy is strongly suggestive of diabetic kidney disease. The preferred test for albuminuria is the urine albumin to creatinine ratio performed on a randomly collected sample, preferably in the morning. On the other hand, the EGFR is calculated from the serum creatinine concentration. Nowadays, we use the CKDEPI formula or the Chronic Kidney Disease Epidemiologic Prognosis Initiative formula as opposed to the MDRD formula. Confirmation of albuminuria or low EGFR requires two abnormal measurements at least three months apart. It features, if features atypical of diabetic kidney disease are present, then other causes of kidney disease need, need to be considered. By atypical features, I mean like um, sudden onset of low EGFR, rapidly decreasing EGFR, abrupt increase in albuminuria, or development of nephrotic or nephritic picture, refractory hypertension, other signs of the systemic diseases. And of course, you know, like uh, decreased uh, GFR by less than 30% within two to three months of initiation of a RAS inhibitor like an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. Right. So uh, you talked a little bit about the microvascular complications of this disease and looking at diabetic retinopathy, which is a microvascular complication, correct? Yeah. So how early can you actually see diabetic retinopathy in these patients? Is that one of those earlier, like you've got GFR going up, but you can look in, look in their eyes and, and see 
the changes in their microvascular vasculature within their eye? Is it pretty early on that that starts happening? Well, you know, while diabetic retinopathy, I mean, as I mentioned, is one of the things we look at, it is not all, you know, the, the common thinking is this, diabetic retinopathy usually precedes diabetic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. okay? yep. However, yep. that is not true in, in a few percent of cases. Um, and so it is not a, while it is a nice uh, correlate, uh, it is not always 100% um, sensitive, uh, to, to put it in a matter of speaking. So there are some patients whom you, you might see have albuminuria EGFR decrease before they have diabetic retinopathy. Although yeah. majority of cases, uh, you see the retinopathy preceding those changes. Right. So... As far as, uh, typically, we don't biopsy these patients, right? Because you know they've got diabetic kidney disease. Um, they've got type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So, you know, once if their GFR starts dropping, you kind of know, okay, this is more than likely related to their diabetic kidney disease and concomitantly also hypertensive nephrosclerosis as well. A lot of times it's, you know, those kind of go hand in hand with some of these patients. Now, it, Dr. Lerma, if you were to biopsy these patients, what would you see um, when you when you do the biopsy? What kind of changes would you see with these patients? So um, that's a very important question. Um, so first of all, I'd like to reiterate what you just said. Uh, when we see patients who present with typical features of diabetic kidney disease, we don't normally biopsy them. Mm -hmm. However, in patients with whom they present with atypical features, such as the ones I mentioned earlier, then you have to start thinking, this may not all be just diabetic kidney disease. There might be another glomerular disease process causes, causing this situation. Hence, you need the biopsy. So if you have to um, biopsy these patients, the common thinking, well, the, the what we know is this. The earliest consistent change is the thickening of the glomerular basement membrane which is apparent usually within one and a half to two years of type 1, di type 1 diabetes diagnosis. This is paralleled by capillary and tubular basement membrane thickening. Other glomerular changes would include uh, loss of endothelial fenestrations, mesangial matrix expansion, as well as loss of podocytes with defacement of food processes. There's another finding, um, mesangial volume expansion which is usually detectable within five to seven years after the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Segmental mesangiolysis is observed with progression of diabetes and thought to be associated with the development of your chemical style Wilson nodules and microaneurysms, which usually you see them together. The exudative lesions result from the subendothelial deposits of plasma proteins, which form the periodic acid shape positive and electron dense deposits and accumulate in the small arterial branches, arterioles, and glomerular capillaries, as well as microaneurysms. These can result in uh, lumi luminal compromise, uh, like hyaline arteriosclerosis. And then similar, subepithelial deposits are seen in the Bowman's capsule. Uh, pathologists refer to this as the capsular drop lesion. And these are also seen in the proximal renal tubules. In the later stages of diabetes, interstitial changes and glomerulo glomerulopathy coalesce into segmental and glomerular, uh, or rather global, sclerosis. Now, in patients with type 1 diabetes, GFR, albuminuria, and hypertension are clinical correlates with mesangial expansion and somewhat less strongly associated with a glomerular basement membrane width. Renal structure changes in patients with type 2 diabetes are similar to those seen in type 1 diabetes, as which I described earlier, but they are more heterogeneous and less predictably associated with clinical presentations. Early renal pathology studies describe a high prevalence of non-diabetic glomerular disease in patients with type 2 diabetes, 
probably because of selection bias, meaning to say patients who were diabetic and underwent biopsies tended to have atypical presentations of diabetic kidney disease, as I mentioned earlier. And mm -hmm. the conclusions from the more recent biopsy studies are a little bit more conservative. They estimate that around 10% uh, prevalence of non-diabetic kidney disease in patients with both diabetes and albuminuria. Well, thank you for that very detailed overview on that. Now, my next question is around disease progression. So we talked about the hyperfiltration aspect of it. Once their GFR begins to drop, what does their disease progression look like from there? So you, when we talk about progression, you talk about the natural history of the disease. Mm -hmm. the, the natural history of diabetic kidney disease includes you know, glomerular hyperfiltration, progressive albuminuria, declining GFR, and ultimately end-stage kidney disease. Metabolic changes associated with diabetes lead to glomerular hypertrophy, glomerular sclerosis, and tubular interstitial inflammation and fibrosis. Now, despite what we know as far as treatment nowadays, there is a large residual risk of diabetic kidney disease onset and progression. Therefore, you know, that's there's really a widespread innovation that is urgently needed to improve the health outcomes of, pa of these patients with diabetic kidney disease. Achieving this goal will probably require, you know, characterization of uh, different um, markers, uh, designing clinical trials that e evaluate pertinent endpoints, development of uh, novel agents targeting kidney-specific disease mechanisms, such as, as we mentioned, glomerular hyperfiltration, inflammation, and fibrosis. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So um, now as far as patients presenting to you in your practice, do you typically see these patients coming later in the disease or do they typically appear to you earlier in the disease where you can kind of intervene earlier? What's been the trend? So the, the, the natural uh, uh, sort of relation is that most of the patients present in the office of the primary care provider. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's a physician, uh, a generalist, or a family practitioner, or even a nurse practitioner, uh, they are often the, um, how, how would I say it, first line of defense, <laughs> right? Yeah. So they're the first ones who see these patients. And then sometimes uh, when they have atypical features, let's say they have nephrotic or nephritic um, features, that's when the nephrologist usually gets called to come in. Yeah. When that happens, whether that happens early or late, it really depends. Uh, for the most part, patients are referred to us when they're already um, probably around um, uh, some progression has happened already. When they identify that maybe the patient has an albuminuria or the patient has um, uh, a lower GFR, less than 60, that's when nephrologists usually get called in. Come into the so can you share with us some general measures and how you manage these patients with diabetic kidney disease and some ways that you can slow down the progression of the disease in these patients with DKD? So the progression of chronic kidney disease in type 2 diabetes is driven by three things. Number one, metabolic factors or elevated blood sugar. Number two, hemodynamic factors such as increased blood pressure. And number three, inflammatory and fibrotic factors. The signaling pathways mediated by these factors elicit structural and functional changes, which as I mentioned, include glomerular hypertrophy, mesangial expansion, glomerular sclerosis, and tubular interstitial fibrosis and inflammation. Collectively, these changes drive CKD progression toward a common pathway leading to fibrosis and progressive kidney dysfunction. So despite our current approaches to management to diabetes and hypertension, use of uh, RAS inhibitors or like ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, there is still a large residual risk in diabetic kidney disease. Uh, novel agents targeting mechanisms such as, as I said, uh, this um, 
uh, microscopic findings of hyperfiltration, inflammation, so on and so forth, I think is sort of the target of our novel therapies right now. Okay. Very good. So, uh, and then as far as prevention goes, uh, management of their blood sugars, obviously, management yep. of their blood pressure, all yep. of that plays into the prevention aspect of it. That's right. So we've talked a lot today about diabetic nephropathy. I know kind of in a short amount of time, it's it's a big topic. There's a lot more that can be said about it. But, you know, just to kind of summarize, we've talked about the burden of the disease. We've talked about the pathophysiology and the epidemiology and how patients typically present to clinic, uh, in, you know, when it comes to DKD. And also we've talked about prevention and management. So Dr. Lerma, thank you so much for joining us today and providing this real detailed and comprehensive overview of diabetic kidney disease. Um, it, is, it, is a, um, it is a big problem um, across the world. And so, you know, however, whatever we can do to slow down the progression of the disease um, is of value. And, um, and we hope that we can do this uh, one step at a time. So again, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to thank you to the nephew community for tuning in. And we hope you enjoyed the discussion today. And we will see you next time here on Nephew. Thanks, Dr. Lerma. Thank you very much, Sean.